Hello everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. We're big, we're bad, we're back with another Fact Friday. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And don't forget to hit that like button. I really appreciate it when I see the likes. And of course, a bunch of comments and questions below. If you have questions for a future Fact Friday, please ask them below. We scour them to get lists like this. Go to producelikeapro.com and you can sign up for a new improved version of the Academy. It's absolutely amazing. Everybody in there is really super helpful. And quite frankly, you'll get 40 plus multi-tracks. You'll, I don't know, you'll get a fast track in learning. It's a really wonderful place. To work all digital in the box is cool, but when would you recommend to go with a real mixing console in a small studio? Oh, <laughs> that is such a loaded question. Look, honestly, I believe that choosing to use a console like I do and working hybrid like I do through an SSL is built on my knowledge and how I grew up making music and also my desire for gear. What I mean is when I was a kid, I listened to, yes, he's going to mention it, Queen and fell in love with it. So what did I do when I had some money? I got a little Kadak console. That Kadak console over there uses the same channels as the console that was in Mom the Shirt in Rockfield and that of course did Bohemian Rhapsody. So I aspire to these things. I still do. Most of us do. We buy music, we fall in love with it, and then we want to play the same guitar as our hero. I even have a Brian May Red special up there. I am a fan of music, so I have, quite naturally, bought the equipment that is associated quite often with some of my heroes. It has helped me feel inspired when recording. When I moved to Los Angeles, I went immediately and recorded as soon as I can at Sunset Sound, because in Sunset Sound, some of my favorite ever records were made. So, heck, I wanted to be in that room recording. These are the things that inspire me. So, why did I say that? I said that because, are you, do you want a console to mix through? Then get one. Get a console to mix through. Find something that matches your needs. But the reality is this. 99% of the time, I am tracking with one mic pre and one compressor. That's the reason why we designed the UK Sound 1173, because we wanted to combine a really nice mic pre with a really nice compressor. It's a 1073 and an 1176 style mic pre and compressor in one box. Why do I say this? Because it's all about the front end. It's all about a great mic with a great mic pre and maybe a great compressor going in. Now, or using your I.O. on the way in. The point is, like, I've, I've talked to Andrew Sheps about this and asked him about mixing in the box. Remember, most of the stuff he's getting to mix is recorded in wonderful studios by great musicians through wonderful pieces of equipment. Great tube microphones like U47s, U67s, going into Neves or APIs, going into LA-2As and Fairchilds and 1176s. Really expensive and beautiful analog equipment. So when it lands with him, 40 or 50 or 60 or 100 tracks of beautifully recorded material that he then mixes. And so he stays firmly in the box and quite often with a pair of headphones on. And this is a beautiful thing. It proves something. The front end makes all the difference. So if you're asking about buying a console, it would be pretty low on my list of things to buy. First of all, I'd be like, what's your mics? Do you have an amazing vocal mic? Get an amazing vocal mic. Do you have a really incredible mic pre? Get an incredible mic pre. Do you have a great compressor going on the way in? If you have all of those things, then you're going to be able to record vocals, guitars, basses, pianos. If you've got stereo of, of stereo mics, pair of mic pre's, pair of compressors, that are, they're identical. If you're in that situation, then you can think about a console. But you have to think, why do you need a console? Uh, do you need a console because you want 12 mic pre's like I have with the Kadak to record drums? Okay, that makes sense. That's 12 identical mic pre's and I record my drum kit through it. That's why I have that console. I have this console, the SSL, because I want this to be how I mix. It becomes a huge template. You know how you make a ten template in your DAW? Well, that becomes my template. It has dynamics on every channel. It has EQ, compression. 
it has gates, it has expanders, it has all of this on the console itself. But the reality is, is if I didn't have it, I would find a way of working in the box and I would also get great results. If you aspire to a console, buy a console to mix through. If you don't aspire to owning a console, then I can list off a huge wealth of incredible mixers that don't mix on consoles. Mark Ender, the last guy in the world I expected to give up his SSL. No longer mixes on an SSL, mixes in the box. That's amazing. Andrew Sheps, owned a beautiful knee for years, mixes in the box. Now, apparently with headphones. I mean, just those two guys alone is pretty incredible. And then a lot of modern, especially pop mixers and R&B and hip hop mixers are mixing, you guessed it, in the box. It's where the world is going. It's not the right or wrong way of doing anything. There is no right or wrong. But if you want a console and you aspire to it, that's a different rationale to saying that you have to have it. Because when Mark Ender is mixing in a box and his mixes, go listen to Hey Soul Sister by Train. Listen to how amazing it is, how big and fat it is without it ever sounding loud or crunchy. Listen to mixes like that. Listen to what he did with How to Save a Life. I mean, phenomenal mix. These are the things that drive me to realize that it's less about the gear and more about the ear. So if you aspire to the console, get a console. If not, mix in the box. You can get amazing results. So many incredible people do. When building out your studio, how do you approach cable management going to and from your equipment? And what were some mistakes you made in the beginning you, you wish you had known before? Okay, it's a bleeding mess over there. It is a freaking rat's nest of cables. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think if somebody was to ask me, I'm probably the last person on in the world that should uh, talk about this. The only thing I can say is use the highest quality cables you can. We have just started using Wireworld cables. They are absolutely phenomenal. They are un freaking believable. There is a guitar cable down here, for instance. This cable is Wirewell. This is the highest quality cable I've ever used. And quite frankly, like really supple and malleable and just kind of like, it doesn't have that sort of like over the top kind of like stiff frick. This is incredible. We've got a whole bunch of these mic cables. They are not cheap, but they are very, very high quality. And I use high quality cables. I really do. We, we've used so many different cables over the years, and I didn't used to believe that they meant that much, but they do. They really do. There are many, many instances where cables don't matter. Short runs, connecting. But you know what? When it comes to running long cables, very long cables, you want high quality. Um, I tell this story all the time of running um, Joe Perry's guitar into three different rooms simultaneously, and we went into a live room, and it was about a 200-foot cable. We ran this huge cable out there, and it started in one room going, Hang! and by the time it got out to the amp in the huge live room, it was Hang! all the high end had gone. And it was just like one of those over-the-counter, inexpensive 200-foot cables you buy from Guitar Center. So we went and got, like the wire world, a super high quality cable and ran it. And the difference was enormous. It was an enormous difference. Now, all the experts out there may tell me I'm wrong, but bear in mind, we're talking a 200 foot cable. We're not talking a 20 foot cable. We're not talking six foot cables. That maybe in a million years, you couldn't tell the difference, but you could audibly tell the difference. And we experimented. We went unplug, plug in, hang, unplug, plug in, hang. <laughs> it was pretty huge. Um, so high quality cables, are the most important thing for me. I've got a mixture of stuff. We're slowly beginning to upgrade and change things out. We have really good quality cables in here, but the Wireworld stuff is the next level for me. Um, there's a reason why we got it, is because we wanted the best of the best. And why am I using them? Because of mastering engineers. Mastering engineers I respect use the Wireworld cables. So it, it dawned on me, who's the last line of defense? Who's the one person in the world that their whole career is resting upon, and that is a mastering engineer. That is the one time and place that you want your music to come back sounding better, not just louder and crunchier and all the other things you can do with four or five plugins, but just like 
everything. You know, when 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 Bob Ludwig and Adam Ayan work on something, it comes back bigger and wider and fatter of more depth and everything. It has everything that we want. So, and that's not to mention Eric Boulanger and, and, and Gavin Lurson and Michael Romanowski and Warren Sokol and Kim Rosen. I don't want to single out. I'm just saying those guys and girls at the top of their uh, game care about these kind of things. So when I got pointed in, in, in that direction, that's why I went with the high quality cables. So as far as organizing, whew, I mean, that's the one part of the game that I'm, it doesn't look pretty here. However, the live stuff out there, the live cables going to the drum kit are gathered together and then in one thing across the floor, and then we have a mat over them, and we also tape down areas so you don't trip over them. I think general organization is really, really cool. But remember, 99.99999% of the time, nothing changes in my patch bay. So once it's patched, it's there. It's accessible, and then I either turn the insert on or off. So that's the reality for me, is to keep it organized, keep it clean. It could do with a clean over there, now I look at it. But keep it organized, Keep it clean and use the best quality cables you can. One other thing I'll say is when I was with Junkie XL um, a couple of weeks ago, when we were in his main studio of the two that we went to. Do you remember every single one of those keyboards? Every, every single one of those keyboards was on the whole time. And when I was waiting for him to come into the studio, I think I leant on a keyboard and, and it like blew my head off. And then I stopped and I couldn't hear any hiss. And when I said to him, how do you keep it so quiet? What, you, what is your secret? He had these little Ashley mixers and I was like, aren't those, you know, those aren't particularly expensive mixers. And he's like, no, the mixers are not an issue. He's like, the amount of cable in that mixer is about this much. He's like, he has the most expensive cables he could afford. And he said that was the biggest game changer for him. When he changed out all of the cables in his studio to really high quality and unbelievably expensive cables, everything got better sounding. And look, there are so many experts that are going to debate this, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to get involved in a debate. But I will tell you, you know, just get the best quality cables you can uh, afford. If for nothing else, even if you don't believe a, a quality increase in, in thousands and thousands of feet of cables, if, even if you don't believe that, at least get a quality cable that isn't going to break. I mean, that's a big, big deal. The reason, the other reason why we use high quality cables is that they don't break when you step on them by mistake. When I bought the cheap ones, they break, they snap, they come disconnected. We had one disconnect the other day. It wasn't that old. And it's really, really annoying, you know, because you unplugged it 10 times from a guitar and suddenly it doesn't work anymore. All of that stuff I don't want to deal with. It's like, to me, I want the best I can afford and build quality is a big deal. So organization, yes, do the best you can. Um, gather your cables together. You know, if they're permanently set up, make sure that they're, they're covered with some kind of rubber mat or they're taped down, whatever it might be. Keep it as organized as you can, but don't beat yourself up. Your job is to make music. And sometimes that can be a little messy. When I go to the studios of Instagram and I see all these beautifully arranged, clean studios, the only thing I think when I see those photos is I feel really bad for that beautiful, clean studio that isn't working at the moment. You know, we're working tonight. I'm going to go in, go to sleep, and then we're working again. There is no time to take beautiful, clean photos. And if your patch bay ends up looking like a spaghetti mess like mine, that's okay. You're busy, you're working, don't beat yourself up. When you mix using your console with tracks that are not as hot as the old fashioned way, does it give the same results of weight and warmth? When you were printing on tape, we always printed the highest possible signal to noise. So we printed really super loud signals. Also, another reason why we hit our tape hard in many instances is because it sounded better the hotter you recorded at. Also, as I think you're pointing out, when you run hot signals through transformers and other kind of discrete circuitry, it seems to sound better. It, it works better. So yeah, if somebody gives me an almost invisible piece of audio, which happens a lot, I will gain it up, I will clip gain it up, I will turn it up, I will make sure that if it's going back through the console, the meters are moving. Because yes, I agree. It's like, remember, this, is, this also has signal-to-noise ratio issues, so it's analog equipment. If I put a little tiny signal through it and then pull the fader up to the top, it's going to be, tss, you know, that's inherent in that. So yes, I will gain 
the tracks up to a level that hits the console, hits everything hard enough to get the best possible sound, but also, quite frankly, the best signal to noise ratio. I hope you're enjoying this. Please, of course, subscribe, hit the like button, and don't forget to put some comments and questions below so we can carry on this discussion. For instance, have you ever used a console? Do you aspire to wanting to use a console? Oh, and don't forget, check out producelikeapro.com. You can sign up for the Academy. You can do a free trial. But also, most importantly, you can download a whole bunch of free goodies if you sign up for the email list. Does the busing from the console get transferred over to Pro Tools with the same setup? You mentioned the drums being on bus one. Will they go through bus one on Pro Tools? Yes, so if I'm working hybrid and I'm not mixing in the box, many of you, of course, will watch our streaming live in the box videos. Those in the box videos are entirely mixed you guessed it, in the box. When we're not doing that and we're working in a hybrid fashion, I, it's not bus one, it's channel one. So what I'll do is I'll have two or three different elements of a kick drum all summed together through channel one, which, you guessed it, comes out of channel one on the console. Snare drum, all bus together. Channel two, channel two. So it comes out master one, master two. Two. So it actually comes out of the I.O., the interface of Pro Tools. And I have 48 outputs on Pro Tools. I have 48 inputs and outputs. Those 48, actually I have 50 inputs because I have a lavery that I mixed to. And of course the Pad 2 by QES. Those two are actually two extra inputs, so that's actually 52, to be pedantic. But 1 through 40 on my outputs of Pro Tools come up through the console. So if I assign an output one from a bust together kick, it comes up on one. Output two, sum together snare, comes up on two, et cetera, et cetera. That goes right across all 40 channels on the console. You'll see that most of the channels are being used, but not all of them. There's a few channels that aren't being used all the time. That's because we're doing more summing inside of Pro Tools and more work inside of Pro Tools before they hit the console. There was a time and a day and an age that when you had you know, um, 48 tracks, um, you would have them coming back, like 224 track machines, individually, all the individual elements of the kicks. Then we started moving into a situation where you had 72 channel SSL consoles, and the reason why you had more than that, even though you may have only had 48 or 24 tracks, is because you were bringing effects returns, you were molting, maybe you had your lead vocal coming out three or four channels with different compression and EQ, you had different, you had all kinds of different fun things. You had subgroups of drums, like a drum crush, like I do on my console, coming up on another pair of faders. That's why you ended up with 72 channels of console, even though you may have only been using 24 tracks on a two inch tape machine. However, with me, I do most of my summing inside of Pro Tools and take multiple tracks and put them at one or two faders here at a time. And yes, they do correspond. It's not the bus that you're asking about, it is master outputs going through the outputs of my interface, one through 40, which correspond to the console's channels, one through 40. When can you first recall seeing a computer in a recording studio? And what was it for at that time? Marvelous question. Okay, the first ever computer I ever saw in a recording studio was uh, an Atari. It was an Atari um, 1020 ST, and it was being used as a um, basic eight track sequencer. And I may have seen one before as a four track sequencer, but my, my recollection is an eight track sequencer. Either way, it is sequencing. So it's sequencing um, like, and it may not have even been MIDI. It was probably MIDI, but remember some of the earliest synths used CV gate. If, can anybody remember those? And so those old sequences in the eighties were triggering all of the different you know, um, synthesizers that you had, either through CV Gate or MIDI, really, really basic stuff. But yeah, the Atari um, 520ST was a revolutionary uh, computer. And then of course the 1040 came out, and then there was one called the Mega 2, which was like twice as powerful again. And those are the first computers I personally remember seeing. Now, don't get me wrong, there was also the SSL computer, which would, which came out much earlier than that, like a good maybe six or seven years before those Ataris first made the studio. They are super um, sophisticated in what they could do for the period of time. But somebody once told me that the iPod Nano is more powerful than SSL 4000 computer from the early 80s. Think about where we're at now, that your iPhone, your Android, 
is hundreds of times more powerful than maybe thousands of times more powerful than anything we're talking about here. The studio computers were around were to do um, fader moves, to save fader automation, to do mute and um, automation, to do full recalls of the EQ, not motorized faders at first, but just so you would sit there and like turn them until they, they um, corresponded with the visuals you were seeing on the computer screen. Then Ataris were doing sequencing and all kinds of fun stuff. That's what they could do. Now your phone could do that in its sleep and also you know film videos and edit them. It's incredible where we're at now. We're at a wonderful stage. So, But those are the first computers I remember seeing. I am currently recording using a 15-year-old M-Audio USB interface. Do you think buying a newer interface that is comparable would significantly improve the sound quality of the original tracks being recorded? Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, I do, yeah. Um, I, I had um, some of those old M-Box and M-Audio stuff. I think I still do flying around here somewhere. Um, the difference is pretty huge. I also had the Digi001 interface, which I've made records on. Um, some stuff that you, you heard on the radio was done with overdubs with my LE system and my, my 9600 Mac with an LE system at my house 20 years ago. So, you know, yeah, 20 years ago, 2001, 18 years ago, I, I was doing it like that. And then when the Mbox came out, and then you had the uh, Digi002, Digi002, Digi003. That, that quality stuff was definitely, you're able to make records. However, interfaces now, even the cheapest Audient ID4 is streets better than that. I also wonder with the old, with the old USB, I don't know the answer to this question, maybe somebody else does, but I also wonder if the latency, how that is, it might be pretty bad as well. So if you get a newer interface, you're probably gonna have much better latency. You're definitely gonna have better sound quality. Um, and to be honest, you get so much more bang for the buck now. The way that technology is going, something that would have been $500 then, which is barely usable, is like $200 now. Everything is cheaper and better at its job. So. Honestly, a 15-year-old interface, I would definitely look at others and upgrade. I think it would be a vast improvement. So thank you ever so much for watching. Of course, please subscribe, hit the like button, but most importantly, leave a bunch of comments and questions below. We love having this discussion. It's an amazing community. Thank you for being a big part of it. If you are helping out and answering other people's questions, that is huge. Get in there and have opinions. Help each other out. I absolutely love it. Thank you, everybody. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing, and we'll see you all again very, very soon. Oh, and don't forget, go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies.